really to uh, enter the uh, Golem A project. I think I'll come into some <coughs> comments at the at the tail end of that of of how uh, you know Chaim and Shmuel uh, got together. I mean, because I was involved a little bit in uh, in that in that process. But then Shmuel will take on as moderating the the rest of the story of uh, of Golem A. Uh, you want us to announce ourselves? Yeah, we'll go just to the names and um, quickly state what you're doing so if somebody gets in the middle of this table, say what happened to that white sack machine that yeah. we're talking about. Uh, I'm uh, Gerald Estrin, and uh, this morning we completed discussion on the white sack project, which had started uh, yesterday, uh, and now we are going to be covering the uh, the early continuation projects uh, beyond the White Tech uh, computer, uh, really an interim period, and then uh, the Golem A uh, project itself. Uh, and uh, do you, Richard, do you want us each to introduce yeah, ourselves just first? Say your name, okay. and then, and then we'll... okay. I'm Hans Josh. Hi, Pekovic. Shmuel Rowan. Myron Melman. Philip Rabinowitz. Okay. Everybody's here this okay. morning, yes. and we did. Why don't we have, uh, do you want to go over the background to the people who are new? Wait. I think as they come into okay. the picture, they'll uh, each will say, you know, how and under what conditions they came to Israel and under what conditions they actually joined the, uh, you know, the project here, and then we'll go on with the discussion. And try and keep in mind that in the continuation of the discussion, there will be at the end at least some uh, comments on the impact of this early work on, uh, uh, on Israel itself and, um, you know, work in the computer field outside. Uh, so, Chaim, we, you know, finished the talking about the Weizsack uh, project, and in fact, the, some of the last discussion was uh, Penny uh, coming to the Weizsack Institute and the great extent of, uh, you know, educating and training programmers that went on, you know, through his teaching, which in fact impacted, uh, you know, a lot of the work that went on later uh, in Israel. but. And yesterday we really had the you know significant piece of the work that went on with the White Sack. So why don't you introduce, you know, as you recall it, what happened at the end of the White Sack project? I'm going to stop by saying how I got to know Pete. Good. <laughs> uh, he worked then at the Bureau of Standards, National Bureau of Standards in Washington. And there was a man there, Alexander, I think. Sam Alexander. Who designed the computer. Project. And that was a computer center in those days. And in fact, we had source from uh, Alexander. At the very last minute, he handed in a report in which he said, the whole White Sack project is uh, crazy. Uh -huh. You should just copy my machine or something like that. Yeah? Uh -huh. at, at the of standard. That was one of the snags. That we ought to overcome. In fact, Kain, let me interrupt. It was characteristic of all of the leaders of the computer project at that time that they were very aggressive, stubborn, and people who thought that their project was really the best one, and they needed that kind of stubbornness in order to go through what was necessary to make those machines. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And I used to visit the uh, Bureau of Standards every year, and Pinner and I were introduced himself one year, second year, he came up again, and the third year he said, when will you get me out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that, Penny? <laughs> and uh, in 55, I was able to, mm -hmm. to invite him. Now, uh, when Weizsack was finished, the load on it was uh, beginning to grow beyond control. Uh, it was the only computer in the country it was used by the army, it was used by economists like Patenkin at the Hebrew University. Julio Rakach, the physicist, took up a big slice of the time. And so we had to think about another computer. And then the first thing that happened was, and that episode may be a lesson to other people, uh, Benner Gren, a magnate in Stockholm, appeared on the scene he had a rather questionable period of association with Goering, 
His wife, I think, was a friend of Goering's. You say who Goering is. Huh? You say who Goering is. You'd be surprised. Goering was the right hand man of Hitler. He was the head of the Air Force and started the head of the Air Force, and then he was the second man of the Nazi party. And um, his uh, agent in uh, London, a Jew, uh, uh, who has a brother, by the way, in Kibbutz Mishmar Emek, who had a brother, uh, was trying to uh, arrange that uh, we forgive Ben Lagan, we would take him in, we invite him. And he gave us to, uh, to understand that uh, Ben Lagan is ready to make some contributions. Uh, the first thing I did when the Ben Lagan issue came to the fore was to write to the Anti Defamation League in New York to send me the dossier on Ben Lagan because I didn't want to get involved in something which was pro-Nazi and so on. I got a dossier, which unfortunately I lost, but the original, of course, is to be found in the files of the uh, Anti-Defamation League, in which they cleared him completely. They said that the friendship was a personal friendship, but other than that, that he used to invite Gehring to his yacht for trips, uh, he uh, did not act in anything objectionable as far as the Anti-Defamation League. Now, I thought if it's good enough for the Anti-Defamation League, I may uh, talk to this man. I visited him uh, once in Stockholm. Uh, I had dinner from on the way back from Finland. I stopped <coughs> there. Must have been in 1960. Uh, he told me uh, his biography. He was the owner of Electrolux. He invented a, a vacuum cleaner in 1912 or 13, and he did a salesmanship job. First thing he did, and this uh, some people may learn how to do salesmanship, he went to the Vatican and demonstrated a vacuum cleaner on the rugs of the Vatican, and they bought a <laughs> vacuum cleaner from him. <laughs> so, so Venegrand said. From the Vatican, he went to St. Petersburg, to the court of the Tsar. A neighbor of his uh, across the Baltic Sea and sold another vacuum cleaner there. And that's the way he started his salesmanship <laughs> campaign. Now, Dunnegan says, I own a uh, electronic company, Begematic, and I'm willing to give one of these computers to the Weizmann Institute free. Uh, if you want to see what it is, go to the University of Uppsala, there's one in operation over there. So I went to Uppsala, it was an operation. They were doing quantum mechanics, uh, quite a bit of computing going on. So one day the Vegematic uh, came in here and we had to prepare for it. We prepared a new hall where uh, a Go Golem A was, where, where Golem B is now. Yeah? And I remember we had to install uh, a stronger air conditioning system, a cooling system. So uh, our engineers of the Weizmann Institute presented a plan that didn't rely on them. So I invited the professor of thermodynamics <coughs> in the Technion. Uh, this is a, a technical school. Yes. And he came and he approved of the uh, plan. It's okay, he said, it should work. Are professors of thermodynamics supposed to know something about air conditioning systems? <laughs> Well, this is, he was a consultant on okay. air conditioning, you know. You know most I would never assume that, but that's <laughs> what he was, yeah. But he told me he's the uh, authority on that, so he approved of it. The Vegematic was installed, it was sweating, it was hot, sweltering. So I bring down this professor from uh, Technion, he looks at it and checks. He says, according to the laws of thermodynamics, this, this cooling system should work. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't. Now, the point is that the Regimatic was with us a number of years. I, I didn't get anything, any computing uh, results out of it, or very little. Uh, and the lesson, to think of all the investments we made in time and and troubleshooting until we learned the language of Vegematic. And Sri Riesel uh, learned how to, how to operate it. He was a... Uh, I never learned how to Sri, it. do you remember this machine? Well, well, what did you have to do with this? I this had collection? very little to do with it. Uh, uh, Micha Krasnitsky was the expert on Vegematic. Uh, and um, 
One thing they did was uh, there was a translator from Vajamari, from Weizsäcker code into Vajamari code, and people were supposed to check their programs on the Vajamari. Uh -huh. But it was uh, terribly slow. Uh -huh. It was too slow to to, to, to take any load of the Weizsäcker. You have some recollection? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the one machine where there were no circuit diagrams whatsoever. <laughs> Everything was written in logical equations. That's so the it was an abstract system. Well, that's what that's because it was it was designed on the West Coast, and on the West Coast of the United States, everything is in equations, and the East Coast, it's all in logic drawing. Uh -huh. Absolutely true. Uh, okay. I didn't know. <laughs> um, the other thing, which was uh, even more exciting, <laughs> was the fact that in some way, um, if you connected the scope to it, the scope was live, <laughs> and Mikhail Krasnitsky got a lot of shocks from it. Okay, so the grounding in the ground system was, was, was not... But yeah. Mika Krasnitsky, Mika Kedem was the yeah. one who was in charge of yes. the installation. Yeah. Is this right, what you remember? Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. You were telling you, me about it, Swedish manual. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a, a, curi a curious thing about... Uh, we got... Um, uh, the machine was essentially a copy of the Orwag 3E. And um, we got some programs from the University of British Columbia, who also had one of these. And we got some programs from the most Uppsala, and we got some programs from the manufacturers, written in Swedish. And um, so we bought a Swedish technical dictionary in order to be able to translate this. And I know German, and sort of, it wasn't too difficult. Uh, and everything went fine, except there was one <coughs> word that I couldn't find anywhere in the dictionary. This little word was Ika. And it turned out that this word was not. <laughs> Everybody else Ica, Ica, yeah. It's the same in Norwegian, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it changed the semantics a little Somewhat. bit. A little bit. <laughs> Finny, you have any recollections of the wedge matic Do you have anything to do with it? Uh, no, uh, wedge matic arrived during the year I was in the States. <coughs> I just remember when I came back, there was this uh, schedule of uses for the Vegematic, and I found this at the Rabinovich. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what, I'm not planning to use a Vegematic. It turns out that this was Dov Rabinovich ah, from so. the crystallography department. <clears throat> I remember there was a uh, program uh, written there by those two bright gentlemen. Uh, Kabbalah and, and Felber on the on the but yeah. on the Vajramatic and assembly program or, or, mm -hmm. or, or the debugging program for the mm -hmm. golem or something which uh, right. nev the never never ran maybe the white side yeah. Which anyway, but there was never, as far as anybody knows, there was, was never some, any computing. There was something. There was computing. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was, there was computing, computing done on it. Yeah. But, but I personally, <laughs> my group. You never received any output. Um, um, not in the library. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I like to talk about the Vegematic. Yeah. After your Vegematic, I want to say something about the interim period. Yeah. yeah the Vegematic um, The Vegematic had a drum memory, uh, which was a vertical drum. And we would start the machine up at 8 in the morning. And it was only about 10 o'clock by the, by the time that the machine had warmed up sufficiently that the heads. Would, were, they were in synchronized with the uh, tracks on the drum. That was one of the things. Mm -hmm. The other thing was that you had to, because it had, I think, four... It was a very large diameter drum, wasn't it? <laughs> That's hard. They call it in. Excuse, Excuse me one second. Slight interruption. Leave out, please. No, no, please, Leave out. This is a very important piece of history that's being recorded. <laughs> I want you to sit here. <coughs> don't, don't worry about your English. We have translators here. Please sit down. And you'll hear what's going on in the rest of the discussion, and you'll catch on. Yeah. Anyway, so it's sort of it's a free discussion of history uh, of computers and lights when you and I'm sure you know as much about it. So what it. do you how do you know most of the uh, uh, era now? Oh. Do you remember the Wedgematic sure. at all? It has a drum on the diagonal of the box. Yes. <laughs> and did it ever do any useful work as far as you recall? No, but the only thing that I remember about the Wedgematic is that uh, 
there was a simulator of the Weizsack on the Vegematic, oh. and it was written by two students, uh, Alex Kopilovich <laughs> and the other fellow. Very good. Sorry, if you could state your name. How you came to Israel and how you... <laughs> how I came to Israel, you have to ask my parents. I know, but that's what you're going to say. And how you came connected with the White Sack project, you know, because that's, uh, you were also slightly involved in. Did you move the chair? Huh? Did you move the chair back? I think back a little bit? Back? No, I, th I think he did move it back. Okay, so well, come forward a little bit. He's getting... Yeah. Uh, me. And, uh, right. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. okay so we'll introduce yourself, your, you know, your name, and, uh, and as I say, how you got to Israel. Yeah, <laughs> my, yeah you can, okay, you can speak proceed. freely. <clears throat> my name is Igal Akkad. I was born in Israel, and after my military service, I was looking for a job. Actually, I was a high school graduate. And once on a Friday, I saw an advertisement in the paper that the Department of Applied Mathematics is looking for high school graduate for uh, scientific calculations, something like this. What year? It was uh, around April 56. Uh, so I wrote to the Weizmann Institute and I was invited for an interview and my test was to give the solution of a, a second order linear equation. Actually, I didn't remember by heart the solution, but I remember the way to get to it. And uh, after maybe two, three weeks, I was asked to come and start working in scientific calculations. Actually, it was an electric calculator Martian that we operate in parallel. It was uh, the first parallel processing that I have ever seen. Uh, it was a... Uh, <laughs> 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 you, you mean you used, used all your fingers? Is that you, what you mean? No, no. What do you mean you operate in parallel? Hmm? What do you mean you operate in parallel? We, we were a group of four people. Oh, see, every two of them were doing the same calculation and about every 15 minutes we compare the results to nine figures, <laughs> nine decimals uh, <laughs> after the <laughs> point. Uh, in fact, he got <coughs> that is not the, the first, because if you look in some of the work of Richardson on developing models you know, of the atmosphere, he has a fantasy there in which he describes himself on a podium like an orchestra leader. And there are people with calculators all through the audience, and he is conducting them. Okay, on what things to do in, in parallel and who should come on and what part of that orchestra. So he conceived for the. Uh, how, how, did, how did you see that the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> it's, actually, anyway. it's actually older than that. You can go back to Babbage and see that what preceded Babbage was that sort of a thing. With, uh, he had him stratified, but, uh, you know, and had names for the people who took part. Or they, right. And he had orchestration and so on, and that's what he tried to replace also. So, so in fact, you got idea. into an implementation of concurrent processing on Marchand calculators. That was your introduction. Yes, all the four of us, sometimes we were more than four, uh -huh. and we sit in one room. It was very noisy, uh, but we did the job. And who was the conductor of this? Uh, was it distributed processing or centralized? It? No, <laughs> the, the operations came to, uh, we had Sarah Bickel. She was the head of the group, and every morning she brought a page with formulas from Professor Peckeris, and by the end of the day, we had to give a result. Uh, is the number greater than 1.704 or less than 1.704? This was the... And you had, you had written the music the night before, you mean? That's what got brought in. Okay. I think they were, they were solving a linearized Boltzmann equation, integral equation, yeah. Yeah, okay, and then? Uh, later on, I started to work with uh, Dr. Zippora Alterman and uh, on, in writing yeah. programs for the... It, it was not actually programming, but let's say translating formulas to the Weizsack. We had uh, 
At the very beginning, I didn't understand exactly what I am doing. The only thing I knew is that we had a, I think we called it an interpreter. We had a junk subroutine 147, and, and then we gave a list of uh, three operands instructions, something like A plus B equals C. It was A, B, C, zero, or A, B, C, one was A minus B, C equal A minus B. And we had up to, I think we used only about five or six of these operations, and we had some conditional jumps also. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the beginning. Means the first, the, the only thing you have to know is to write jump support in 147 and how many instructions you have in the list. And here you take a formula and you translate it to the computer. And we had a simulator for single precision floating point and double precision floating point. So by the time of the end of the, because you say 1956, you this came was, the no, core we, memory. We, this was not, uh, we had already the core memory. You one, had, okay. And it was, I think, at the beginning of 57 already. Mm -hmm. I spent about Fine. six months on the motion from the parallel processing. And so then at the end of this, the WhiteSec project, what do you remember, uh, you know, about this wedgematic and this interim? Uh, let me tell you something, he's introducing himself. Yes. May I add something? Yes. yes. The more interactive, uh, the better, yeah. You go, uh, I got came, as you said, as a computer, a hand computer. And the poor Alterman taught him, as far as I remember, programming. Uh -huh. It didn't take long for him to learn programming. I think it was a matter of a week or so. Now, I spoke at that time to Eagle's father. He says when Eagle was a baby, the visitors would come to his house. He would say, what's your name? Chaim. He would immediately say, you, the letters in your name add up to a certain number. He had a arithmetic ability <coughs> as a baby. You yeah. were involved in the Kabbalah. You must have. You know, in, in Hebrew language, you know, every letter has, has associated with it a certain number. So here, this was one of the fortunes of, of, of our working here. Uh -huh. This, uh, this baby. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I have to add something else. In this, uh, with nature, uh, 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 with nature, ability, a great arithmetician already from, from birth. Uh, I came to my actual entry to the computer business was, I think, it was on Holamoid Sukkot, fifty-seven or fifty-eight. Uh, Professor Kip Peters came to my home, so it was a vacation, and he brought a page with some formulas and he asked me, can you program this for me? And I had two possibilities, either I say yes or no, <laughs> I said yes, and so I, didn't, I was not sure at this time that I can do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, I was working with uh, Professor Tegris for the next, maybe, now, three years. Now, Eagle says that he joined in April 1956. One of our highlights of our work in the whole history of the department was the paper on the uh, ground state of two electron atoms, which was published in 58, but I think it was submitted at the end of 57. Mm -hmm. So within Years ago. Okay. This was the page with the formulas that yeah. wrote me yeah. on this. <laughs> 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 and uh, about these formulas, uh, Professor Herman Feshbach of MIT uh, told me when he saw this paper, he was wondering when Chaim had this this uh, equation, mm -hmm. it was a recursion relation between the functions. He says, Why didn't you drop the whole thing? It was so frightening. <laughs> But not for, for you. He didn't know enough to be frightened. <laughs> <laughs> and I must uh, say that the uh, two electron atom research and then the three oscillations of the Earth and where it's for Altamont mm -hmm. and Hans Jarosch. Hans Jarosch started the three oscillations of the Earth. Mm -hmm. and then came to Paul Altamont. Yeah. Uh, and particularly the tide in the world oceans, mm -hmm. those were major operations. Finished only in 1978, started in 1960 with but then uh, that was just a feasibility statement. Mm -hmm. I, got, uh, I used to, I had some other uh, programmers after a while, and I would start new problems with them, and they would investigate whether it's going or not. But the final thing I would hand over to, to Yigal and he, and would, 
And his ability was when he gets the, the, the output of the computer and he looks at it and, and twists his mouth and he says, I don't like the smell of this. That's one of the major faculties in, uh, uh, in working with, with, uh, with computers. Right? To have a sense for rejecting what looks like garbage. Rejecting nonsense. Now, I think, I thought he was the best computer in the world. He certainly was in, in, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Until Amir Nuaili came, who did some fancy things where I said some things, Nuaili, but Nuaili did, did, did uh, last one as, as a programmer. Nuaili started about it. Uh, That's right. I remember that. Right. Okay. And now. At the very beginning on the point that we actually didn't, we have only what I think probably we spoke about it, that we had only about four. 4K of memory? Yes. That it, and no 4096 memory. words, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. At four, the very four, beginning, you had only the drum, but, this, yeah, but, but then when the core memory came, four, right? yes, it was a 4K memory. And we didn't have any additional storage, no magnetic tapes? No, we did have yes, magnetic tapes. No, magnetic tapes only later. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we started, when I started, there were no magnetic tapes, and then we had yeah. one magnetic tape, I think it was Potter or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. that's very nice. Which didn't have, there was no low point on this tape, uh -huh. and we had to watch to <laughs> to bring the tape to the beginning of the information. Uh -huh. It was a soft uh, load point. <laughs> yes. And uh, later on, when we received the Ampex tapes, then we were, were in the business. Marvelous, yeah? Yeah. And then we added some more memory, it was called the Erma. Uh -huh. Does someone remember the Erma? Sure. That, that actually came uh, with Irv Weisman. Schmidt's first project. Yeah. No, 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 no. This it's actually was in the in-between period, and in fact, Irv Weisman, who is now with Apple, uh, was the uh, data product specialist at Apple. Yeah. 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 And he came with Irv Weisman. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Weizmann Institute. Problems how are able to run on the, the, the transit. Uh, what about the relative speed? Was that a much faster machine than the white set? The transit? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we should remember that writing on the white set was writing an absolute code. Yes. Only at the very late we had the, an assembler, which was part of it was written by Hans, I believe. And I don't remember who was... Uh, Again, from England, whose name I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was. Penny thinks that was never used, it the assembler. Not. In our earlier discussion, he doesn't remember it ever being used. I remember when I started to write programs at the right stack, and the way that we wrote the programs, there was two ways. Either you write it into absolute code, and you knew exactly where in memory you load the program, and you have to write all the addresses. The, the code was hexadecimal. Mm -hmm. There were yeah. 10 uh, characters per uh, 40 bits of uh, memory, two instructions per word. And, but uh, the, the other way is to write the programs as they should be loaded to address 800 hexadecimal. And then we had a routine that was called incorporator, which was started on the address 028 on the right hand side. <laughs> and <laughs> Who wrote that? I believe Pini, because mm -hmm. everything that was in the bytes like when I came was written by Pini. <laughs> and uh, then you load all the programs and you tell the incorporator to which address to relocate this program. And it knew that everything that is greater has a most significant bit in the address uh, should be uh, adjusted to the right uh, relocated. Penny, do you remember that starting at 028? <laughs> no. <laughs> Was it called V1, the incorporator? Uh, I, I don't know about what it was called. I, I, remember, I remember writing it, obviously. Yeah. It was a very short program, maybe yeah. 10 or 12 words. And if any time, a funny little story about, yeah. the, about, the, okay. about the white sack. There was the, a, con a, might be a contest of how many words it would take to clear the memory. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and somebody said, well, you have to have a loop, and uh, it proved mathematically <laughs> that it would take a certain number of words. Okay. And then this fellow, the Yanis Chef, came along and he did it in less. <laughs> and, 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 and how did he do it in less? He wrote a small program which planted clear words in half the memory. <laughs> and then he zipped through that thing which cleared the whole memory. He rectified the loop, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so this was the idea. The target was even to clean the memory where the program was loaded. Sure, sure. To, to start with uh, a clean memory. And the, the final version, I think, was four and a half words. Uh, four words. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? I think it was four. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, now what I want to say, tell about PIMI, the way that we all, I used to write programs, that you start writing and you leave uh, addresses blank until you knew to which uh, location you have to jump. Let's mm -hmm. say that you write a program to 8, 800, and then in the third instruction you have a jump, so you waited until you came to this place, and you inserted the instruction, let's say, 801A or, or something. Uh, Pini didn't do it this way. When he wrote a program, he knew all the addresses in advance, and I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> so he was able to type the program directly into the on the flex writer, because if you write on the flex writer, you have to know everything in advance, right. and he did it. <laughs> do you want to tell your secret now? I don't want to tell a story, but I want to tell, tell a story about uh, 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 when I was in South Africa three or four years ago. Uh, somebody, uh, I was there at the university, and some of the fellows there said to me, oh, Would you like to write a program? Uh, no, I'm not particularly interested. I was there on the giving a course, I wasn't. And, and computing to do at the time. A couple of weeks later, he comes over to me and he goes, We have this console here, would you like to write a program? I, said, I told you once before, I don't have any programming computation. Why are you asking me again? Said, well, I'll tell you. Uh, when 
Mitzi, Professor Mitzi was here last year, and when he heard you were coming this year, he told us that when I was at the Bureau of Standards, my programs worked the first time, <laughs> and uh, they wanted to see a demonstration of that. Because <laughs> they'd never seen that before. <laughs> it's a slight exaggeration, of course, as I, as I mentioned before with the uh, overflow, right, right. which I'll always remember. But, uh, I think one more thing, we had, the, on the right side, we had the shortest blow deal that ever exists somewhere. We had a blow deal which was two words of program. This was the blow deal, uh, if you want, I can uh, tell yeah, you. Yeah, one of the two words, words yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the way that we prepared the tape of programs was that the first two words were the blow deal, and then, because the only input was paper tape. Sure. And uh, the next, we had blocks, what the first uh, one, one block was uh, an address and then a block of data to run into this address. And we had special in instructions that you can read with one instruction a whole block of words uh -huh. from a paper tape stored in uh, consecutive Address. ad addresses in memory. And then when it uh, reached a, a space at length, on the pocket on the tape, then it jumped to the next instruction. And uh, the other thing that we had, we had two instructions to read a contents of a word into the only into the left hand uh, address part of the instruction or into the right hand side. So the way the loader worked was one instruction is to read an address to the left hand side of the next word. And then, uh, actually, we needed a jump after an every read instruction to adjust the P register back. I don't know if it was called the P register, it was called the instruction mm -hmm. mm -hmm. register. Yeah. Program register. Hmm? Program, Program register. Program register. Okay. Yes, but in, on the right side, it was mm -hmm. called the program register. Yeah. And the next instruction, then we had an instruction with the correct address, and then we read the whole block of data, and then we had another jump to the first instruction to read the next, next uh, address. Uh, okay. This was the long yeah. The In the rest of the, the interim period, time, what was going yeah, on? Yeah, so I want to say something about didn't satisfy your needs, yeah? I, I want to say something about 1604. Okay, yeah. yeah. Also, played a non-trivial role. Uh, are you it in came, it, no, getting late? It came after, it came, the 1604 was bought after the uh, problem was started. Yeah, I'd like to back up rather, because Chaim, here you were, pressure of computation, <coughs> Legimatic is a, is a failure in a, in a sense of satisfying that, and you had choices. What led you to go, you know, seek to build another machine? Yeah. Uh, well, the load was great. In fact, we, we were hope so great that even after the Golan project was started, we uh, needed a, a interim computer. I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. And it, the uh, Taubes group in the University of Illinois, in Urbana, was building a Niliac. They also had made a copy of Janiac yeah. uh, with improvements, uh, and they were designing Niliac Cube which uh, was going to be the second generation uh, computers. And he agreed to let us have the plans when it's ready. And that was, uh, I think, in 19... way back. 59. 59. 59, we took the... Yeah. And, uh, but their computer, Ilya Q, was late in, in uh, getting finished. Uh, at that time, the uh, business director of the Weizmann Institute was a former head of the uh, Israel Air Force, General Remes. He was here for one year. One day he called me up and he said, a friend of mine, Mike Melman, an engineer in New York, uh, wants to come to Israel, can you accommodate him? So I said, I'll try. And I thought, we'll send Mike Melman to Illinois to uh, sit there and uh, learn how to build a computer. And then when it's finished, you'll come here and, and uh, build the, uh, something like like, uh, like you did. <coughs> well, the computer was uh, slow in, 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 in uh, being fi getting finished. And um, 
people became skeptical as to whether the Iliac II will ever be finished. And I, uh, the Esplins, I used to come every year to, the, to UCLA, the Esplins used to throw a huge party of 150 people or so. And um, I like to take a drink, but after one drink, I now know I should never make faculty appointments. Uh, uh, and I did. In, uh, couple of cases, mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention names, yeah? But those were great, great parties. Um, you mentioned to me, I think you introduced me to a, a, a computer expert, Kashmir Uman, at one, at one of your parties. Right, and I'm going to jump in here. And you you yeah. raised it very high, so that's something to Let me. Let me say the following thing, that after uh, leaving here in 1955, I went back to the Institute for Advanced Study uh, for a year, and during the course of that year there were many complex events, but the computer project did not continue at the Institute for Advanced Study, and the small group of engineers there uh, went and talked to people in the industry and at, at universities, and in fact, uh, C.B. Tompkins at uh, UCLA had come by uh, and had said, you know, please come out and consider us. Uh, come and become a member of the faculty. There was the, uh, the SWAC computer had been developed there, there was a numerical analysis research uh, center there, and he said the mathematics department, the engineering department would like you to come and start uh, computer education and research here. Uh, now, I went there actually in October 1956. The day I arrived at UCLA, uh, there was another person who joined the faculty, it was Cornelius Leandus, who had come from the University of, uh, of Pennsylvania, uh, had done his work in, in computers, but really was going on to uh, develop research and education in control systems. And we came into the same office on the same day, faculty at uh, UCLA. Uh, sometime after that, uh, Corny Leandis mentioned there was somebody I should meet who had come to the Los Angeles area, uh, and it was Schmiel Ruman, uh, who uh, he had known, <coughs> and in fact that I might play some role in, in do, when did you come actually to Los Angeles, Schmiel, do you remember what year? I think it was in 57. 57, that would be about right. And that, in fact, I might, you know, recommend housing a temple because Corning Leandis wasn't Jewish and he knew that Schmiel was. And uh, we got to, to know each other uh, in, this, in this process. And in fact, Schmiel moved up into the, uh, the same area where, where we lived at the time. We also had professional encounters as part of a program committee for uh, a joint computer conference uh, going on at that time. And uh, Schmiel was working for Packard Bell, and one of the earliest uh, you know, small computers that, that were developed. And I gained a great deal of appreciation for uh, the kind of work that, that he did. And then it was about the time that actually Brian Peckris said that he was really looking for the contacts to possibly do another computer development uh, project, and they brought you two together. Uh, I think it was in your office, Schmiel, if I remember. It was uh, correct. In my office it was? That I, I don't remember. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you. Now, now you take on from here. Yeah. You know. yeah. um, I was in Indianapolis in connection with another intern computer, 1604, and from there, it must have been late in 1960. Yeah. Or the summer of 1961. Or it, no, it's either, it either was late in 59 or early yeah. in 60. Yeah. Anyway, I, from there I flew to uh, Indianapolis. Mike Millman was there. Mm -hmm. I saw the uh, Iliac II, a huge thing. In fact, it was so huge that in, in retrospect, when I started thinking about it, uh, I thought it must have been a tube machine. It wasn't. Uh, but it was, I was wondering whether we'll get any whites on issue. Maybe we'll have to dig the floor to accommodate it. And there was gloom over there. Gloom because already the fourth year there were uh, 
but back in the in the sched lagging in the schedule and and uh, uh, I asked the uh, uh what are the chances that we will be able to copy this uh, he wasn't enthusiastic uh -huh. he, he didn't. so from there Mike and I flew to Los Angeles and that was the first time I met new woman it was in your office I think it was on a Saturday it was in our house in the living room, because I remember you. Yes, that was when we first actually met. Yeah. I met you and Leia at the Estrin, at, at, the, uh, Estrin, yeah. at one and of these famous uh, parties. cocktail parties. And then the second time we were yeah. had a business and, meeting. And uh, at this meeting I ordered Thelma to take notes, <laughs> which <laughs> she didn't quite... Didn't, quite didn't endear you to her. Yeah, but she right. did, but she did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first time I saw Shmuel Roman, we, we told him, Mike Norman told him about the operation, and I watched him very closely. He was a man of a few words, but I noticed whatever he said was to the point, and it was logical and made a very good impression. And so my spirits rose. Uh, well, from there you take it. Yeah, and I think there's a good time to introduce well, yourself, Shmuel. Well, I, I introduced myself before. Do it again, yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, Shmuel Roman. Uh, I would like to go back to, uh, to to Corner Beyond This because that brings me back to really my beginning in computers. Uh, Corny and I were both at the Moore School, which was uh, one of the uh, early um, centers of uh, computer development. And I got in on the tail end of the EDVAC. And in fact, uh, I spent most of my time there designing a machine which was a cousin to, uh, to the Alexander machine in the bureau, the SIAC. Except uh, ours was never, was called the MSAC and it was never completed. So it was a rather bad way to get into the computer business to have this disappointment in the very first project. But that's the way it was, uh, the, it was in those years. Many of these projects never got completed. Uh, I can just say that uh, I managed to complete my part, which was the uh, arithmetic unit, and actually tested. But the machine was never completed and never saw any use. But that's how I met uh, Corny. Uh, Corny at that time was working on DDAs, which I got to later. And uh, that's a digital difference. Yeah, and and, and uh, he he was very impressed with my uh, ability in uh, circuits. And he would go tell everybody that I'm the best the computer designer in the world, mm -hmm. which was uh, very complimentary. It was also rather embarrassing. And uh, that's, in fact, how I got to Los Angeles, because uh, when they started organizing the uh, Packard Bell Computer Corporation, and uh, Max Polevsky was doing that, he and Bob Deck from, the, uh, from Bendix they, they started the company. When one uh, one Saturday, uh, Sunday evening, he, out of the blue, he calls me from New York or something and tells me some tall story about they're starting a company with money from uh, Von Brown to uh, help the Man on the Moon project and all sorts of things like that. And I sort of wrote it off, And I, but then uh, I had pressure from uh, Marion, who was about ready to move to the, my wife, to move to the West Coast. So eventually I wrote and, uh, and came that's how uh, we got together in uh, uh, Los Angeles. But I might say that uh, my, my experience before coming to the Institute was, um, was not exactly the right experience for the job. That is, I had worked mostly on commercial uh, machines, serial machines, uh, where cost was important and not the maximum speed and the, the utmost in performance. But uh, so I had to switch gears. But um, um, I might say that uh, I, I was interested in Israel. I, I know I'm going to say something about how I got to Israel altogether. I uh, I had for years uh, planned to go to Israel. It was a question only of when, because say where uh, you were born, Shmuel. Well. No, my my per my biography is is much too complicated and long to uh, to start telling it, but I was born in uh, in Eastern Europe, Bessarabia, and I was in the in the uh, youth movement, the Zionist youth movement, in the Shomer Tzair, as a matter of fact, and um, 
and they used to toss you out if you left and went to to America to the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, and um, but these were unusual times. It was just before the war, and uh, I went because I was only fourteen, and my parents were, were leaving. So. They made an exception and they didn't toss me out and gave me a big uh, a farewell party uh, and which scared my mother out of her wits because uh, the Shomer Atzeir was underground. <laughs> and uh, in any case, um, I, I pledged that I would uh, find my own way to Israel yeah. eventually. And, but then it took a long time. I won't go into all the uh, reasons why uh, I went to study in the States. I lived in Central America. I came to the, I went to the States to study as a foreign student and uh, didn't plan to stay. But eventually I stayed 15 years before I, uh, I, I found my way to the Weizmann Institute and to Israel. But uh, coming back to, to the beginning uh, of uh, the, the connection with it, with with the Weizmann Institute in Israel, um, the um, I think that as early as fifty nine maybe uh, Chaim uh, uh, said uh, something about maybe uh, coming to visit or uh, but eventually in I think in nineteen sixty he actually invited me and suggested. Uh, he suggested that I apply to uh, Fulbright uh, for a Fulbright Fellowship. Everything was fine except, although I knew what the project was, uh, I had to de describe some kind of a research project for them, and I, I really didn't know what to say. So I made things up, and it turned out to be very, very close to the truth. Uh, I just looked it over the other uh, the other day. My application to the uh, to why did you write this? I talked about uh, high-speed techniques and uh, transmission lines and the uh, length of cables and so on, and uh, it was very much in the, the way it happened. Now, the other thing was that when I applied to Fulbright, uh, they somehow can, because of my name perhaps, they decided that I was an Israeli in the States applying for a grant to Israel, and they said they don't do that sort of thing. So I thought that was the end. Mm -hmm. But then when I explained uh, my position, I eventually got it, in fact. And um, that's how I came in a Fulbright for one year, for nine months, and uh, never returned. What year? Uh, this was in the fall of 19, in October 1961. Now, um, I, I was, uh, as, as was already mentioned, um, uh, I was fortunate because I uh, I had uh, there was Tzvi who was running uh, Tzvi Rizal who was running the the rights act and had had a uh, uh, cons uh, long ex long experience and rich experience in computers. There was Mike Melman who was uh, participating. I was yeah. No, but he, who was who was at the University of Illinois participating? Did you visit the University of Illinois? I visited in the University of Illinois. I think for three days before when? I. On the way, or, or a few months before I came to Israel, mm -hmm. and that's when uh, I became acquainted with the uh, project. And Mike was participating; wasn't just learning; he was participating in the project there. And oh. um, <laughs> and in fact, uh, the whole the the the, the real uh, secret of uh, being able to make a machine, to design and build a machine, in a year and a half or so, or two years is the fact that uh, we did take the, the uh, system design and a lot of these uh, decisions, so some of which are arbitrary, and those are the most difficult and most time-consuming decisions to make, we didn't have to make. Of course, there were some decisions later which, uh, which we made very easily too, and uh, one interesting thing is how we arrived at the... Uh, everybody agreed that we had to have a long word length in the Golem because uh, on the right track, uh, for years, uh, the big problems were running in double precision. The question was only what should le word length be, and the, 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 uh, the decision was made very easily. We had a meeting in Chaim's office, and he said, what is the longest word, uh, mantissa you would consider? And I, and 
I said uh, 65 mm -hmm. and uh, he said fine and what is the <laughs> longest <laughs> exponent you would consider? He said 10 and that's how the decision was made to have a 75 bit word and this was based on being able to fit the uh, the circuits into into the cabinet. So his criteria were clear. He wanted the longest <laughs> word that he could get. I mean, this is and, and ours was what we could fit in because by then we knew uh, the structure and the uh, physical layout. Um, what was the word length of Iliac two? Fifty-two bits. Fifty-two bits. Um, can I can I say something at this point connected with this? Sure. Yeah, um, the the Iliac two had a word length of fifty two bits, and this consisted of four quarter words of thirty bits. And the reason the reason for this was that they had an eight k memory, and they needed thirteen bits for the address. Now here was already decided we would need a thirty two k memory in the end, but we actually only bought a sixteen k. But it was intended, and uh, fifty two bits obviously wasn't long enough, and it didn't fit into fifteen. So either, the question was, anyway, only either 60-bit word or 75-bit. And since we needed the extra precision, I think that's how the, that's yeah. part of the decision for the 75-bit. Okay. Uh, Shmuel's going to moderate this. Well, I, I think that uh, maybe I'll, I, I'd like to come back and talk about some of the, uh, the things that, some of the achievements, shall we say, in the Golan A project. But maybe, since I started with introductory uh, matter, maybe we should uh, go around at least to Tsvi and Mike uh, be, to uh, their see first their, their first impressions uh, mm -hmm. and how they got into it. So perhaps uh, Tsvi, would you like to say something about the beginnings? And uh, well, um, it was clear to me that the need a new machine. You got to build a new machine. The, White suck was not going to last. And it has to be some, time, some kind of transistor technology. And the question was what? For a while, we played around um, with uh, DCTL, which was invented by a friend of Brian Becker's at, uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, by Rubinoff? By Rubinoff, that's right. Mm -hmm. Rubinoff I'm not came, sure he invented it, but he, he was consulting. He gave us a series a of time. lectures of DCDL. It yeah. sounds very good, but um, after a while, it turned out that DCDL is not, not reliable in, the, in these tall end gates, especially. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that's what they used in the, in the, in the transaction, no? Uh, they, they, they say they only in the very first version they gave it up also very first. So, so, <coughs> so that was a bad idea. Then, uh, when Schmidt came along, he had, uh, he knew about a very fast transistor, still germanium, that had then come out. And, uh, that would have the speed. And this was the basis. So the, the system to design the, the basic uh, algorithms that we took from Illinois, uh, but we redesigned the logical design and we repackaged it uh, into uh, really the 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 Iliad too. Uh, I've only seen photographs. I've never seen the wooden. Barely fit into the zoom, right? Yes, the golden it extended was, into the in, into the uh, cell. Yeah. No, it had it's into the cell. It up, up, it up into the cell. Yeah, it uh, ran into the cell. Yes, uh, the golden age was two cabinets. Everything, uh, including I/O. And this was a much longer word. Yeah. And this was a lot much longer. So, um, however, we were unlucky with memory. No, perhaps. Well, we didn't design our own. No, we, we, we were unlucky with the memories we bought. Uh, the first one was a, somebody called Indiana General. General. That was a flop altogether, and eventually we got Ampex. Fabitech. Fabitech, yes, that's a Fabitech memories of uh, 32K. Okay, so maybe we, since we're right. talking about Illinois, maybe you would like to say, since sure. is your uh, first hand, uh, have first hand acquaintance with it, Mike? Yeah, uh, I was uh, working on uh, data processing equipment uh, out on Long Island, 
when um, my wife one day says uh, she's had it and she's ready to go home. So I uh, went ahead and prepared my resume and sent it on to, uh, to Israel. Um, to no one uh, in particular, but to via a, uh, an acquaintance in New York City. And only now, Chaim tells me that uh, Aaron Remez uh, had the resume, and, uh, and that's the manner in which uh, he uh, heard about me. So uh, Chaim and I did meet in New York uh, at the end of the summer of 1959, and I had then agreed to uh, go out to uh, Illinois. Uh, I was at Illinois until the summer of 1962. Now, about Iliac II, Iliac II was uh, a monstrous machine, uh, 52 bits in length. Uh, it was made up of discrete wiring chassis, sized uh, one foot by two foot, and uh, they had five of these chassis in height so that the chassis themselves took just a little over 10 feet. Uh, if you introduce the inter-chassis structure and wiring, uh, it went from floor up to about 12 to 15 feet high. Uh, that was the height of the machine. The power supplies for the machine were in the basement. The length of the machine, the width of the machine, was of course dependent on the, uh, the bit size, and uh, ILIAC II was designed using a type of logic which was uh, very uh, respectable at the time, called speed independent. There were no, uh, all circuits were DC uh, coupled, there were no uh, one-shots anywhere in the uh, equipment. The uh, strategy of the logic was to send the signal out to the length of the uh, accumulator and to uh, wait until a, an echo reply uh, came back before the next uh, uh, change of state was declared. Uh, this uh, turned out, uh, after the system was completely uh, built and checked out, that it introduced uh, huge delays in uh, the execution times. But the uh, logical strategists at Illinois were very firm and adamant in their uh, belief in this uh, type of logic. <coughs> and. Uh, after uh, several years, I found out that they had eventually uh, shortcut the, uh, the round trip of this uh, echo uh, strategy and made the delays uh, somewhat faster. They were essentially uh, cheating, faster. cheating on the... Uh, they were, in fact, indeed cheating on their own logic. On the speed yes, independence. On the speed principle. independence, yes. Was this that, Ralph, <coughs> Ralph Meager who was running the project? Uh, no, this was a after Ralph mm -hmm. Meager. This was eight under eight eight tabs, tabs management. However, Ralph Meager was present at all strategic decision-making. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, his uh, concept of building this machine was maintained uh, with iron hand. It was for that reason that uh, even in the uh, early part of 58, 59, people at Illinois were uh, trying to investigate the possibilities of building this uh, by means of printed circuitry. But uh, Meager's strategy was, uh, was firm, and they were dedicated to this uh, uh, direct wiring, no printed circuit, these huge mechanical uh, chassis, one by two foot, uh, not to mention the busing uh, all the way down the end of this uh, arithmetic unit. I think we put was, together uh, a couple of these boards here just to try them out. Uh, I, I brought one back with yeah. me, uh, but I, I don't uh, know. That, that was, I think you had, uh, in, from the very outset, decided yes. to go to uh, printed circuits. 
One other reason which was uh, influential here was the unavailability of the 2N509 transistor, which they used. Yeah. And that's why uh, we had to go. We found the 705, uh, the 2N705 was the, the substitute so that there was a complete changeover in the strategy of the uh, of the logic organization yeah. Yeah. here yes yes well, that that brings me more pretty much to the uh, say the, the, pardon uh, me there, there was also oh, this matter of the uh, the word land yes we we did end up using uh, uh, an identical uh, set of instructions i believe one or two instructions were slightly modified but other than that, the full Illinois set was uh, adhered to. The, uh, the algorithms, uh, the multiply and divide uh, algorithm, of course, uh, Robertson's divide uh, division algorithm was, was new at the time, and it, it worked out, uh, was working uh, very well. So that uh, the major uh, alterations or logical changes that we had to perform here was the changeover from the uh, 52 bits to the uh, 75 bits and whatever details uh, went along with that. Yeah, well, l let me perhaps start with the, uh, w with the uh, circuit uh, question, which was the central one in the beginning. Um, we have... Yeah, tell us how you managed to compress this U. Yeah, thing. that's the point. The real, the, real, the real point in the circuits is that that the uh, Iliad II uh, was based on uh, on uh, uh, non-saturating circuits, and um, furthermore, they had made their decisions back in '56, <coughs> and uh, because of the delays in their program, they ended up with this uh, outmoded uh, transistor. Essentially, it was an uh, RF amplifier. Yes, it was. It, that's right, and it it was it was only made by Western Electric, which doesn't really sell to uh, outside of of, uh, of the right. telephone company, and they had to beg and steal. No, and this was an R. It was uh, yes. Iliac Two was a, an ARPA supported project. Yeah. That's how they. So, <coughs> so that that was the, the basic thing, and this the uh, because it was an unsaturating circuit, it was very complicated. Uh, it was um, very high power because uh, you know if if you have a saturating circuit, it, the circuit is either in a cut off or it's or it's in full it's saturated and in both of these conditions it doesn't dissipate uh, any power to speak of it's only during transition that it does and um, just about the time when I was getting ready to come to Israel um, appeared um, the uh, Epitaxial Mesa transistors, which were uh, the first real fast uh, switching transistors. This was still germanium. And in fact, the whole machine was built with germanium. The diodes and the uh, transistors we used were germanium. And uh, the thing that further contributed to the, um, to the economy of the design was that, um, that we used a two-level diode gate and uh, transistor amplifier, and this was the basic uh, element. Um, furthermore, um, we were able, by designing this carefully, we were able to use, to design the, the uh, standard gate so that it could, in fact, drive a transmission line, meaning uh, a twisted pair. And um, it seems a little uh, strange that that far back uh, one should worry about terminations and transmission lines, but the uh, the fact is that as small as the Golem uh, A was, it still uh, was was big enough so that um, there were lines that ran as long as uh, two, two, two to three meters, and at the speeds we were uh, running, uh, it already required uh, a terminated transmission line. This more or less was the, uh, this allowed us to, to reduce the power and the size by about a fa an order of magnitude. The size, of course, was further reduced because the circuits could be uh, put on, uh, on printed circuits, could be mounted on printed circuits. And here I'd like to add a little story. Uh, 
the about the, the printed circuit facilities. They're, they're um, you know, in the states before I came here, I was a, I was accustomed to. We didn't make our own printed circuits. We had, although the company in fact had a had a division that made printed circuits, but we didn't require we weren't required to buy from our from from them. And uh, we had outside vendors. We just designed things, and then we would pre prepare a, a drawing, and then we'd send it out. We'd have a few companies that uh, we had tried and approved them, and that was it. But here, it was a different kind of world. Uh, but when I came, it turned out that uh, somebody, I don't remember who it was, whether it, it might have even been Micha uh, still. Micha started it. Started it on Edelbaum. We had started making... Uh, Experiments making our That's own. Right. Uh, and so there circuit. was the beginnings. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, in fact, what it amounted to was a plastic uh, garbage can. Uh, you'll excuse the expression, uh, which in which was mounted uh, a, a, a a vertical uh, shaft, and around this was uh, there was the the, uh, the the container was filled with uh, with with the acid. And um, and they had a a, a, a motor on a motor, a motor on top of the, motor shaft. on the outside, which turned the shaft, and um, and 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 there was a a, a propeller which would um, pump the thing and spray the thing all around, and the the boards were simply mounted all around the periphery of this uh, garbage can, and. Um, well, it, we made experiments and it turned out not to be good enough, meaning that the, uh, the accuracy, the precision, and it was, uh, I don't remember, it was, I think it was uh, Guido Nebelbaum and maybe, but in the end, Arya Ramon made a, an improved version. We had, we, had, we had made all the cards for Irma on the that's garbage. Right, that's right. And so we made some improvements to this, uh, to this rig. And produced a new one, which uh, was good enough. And it, the whole uh, machine was built on one-sided printed circuits. Uh, the, you can say the whole com the whole golem was built in that in that garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, how many people will join us for lunch? Because I want to make sure the arrangements have been made. Yeah, at twelve thirty in the San Martin. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 I'll do it uh, for social reasons only, of course. Of course. Well, he won't have the camera. For social reasons. Well, that's what they thought. Yeah. I, I didn't, that wasn't my <laughs> meaning. I didn't understand what I meant by that. Do we break? That's right. Now, but it, are we breaking? Is that the end that we're breaking now? Well, I think we'll choose. Is this a good moment for a break? And then they'll meet. It's too early for lunch. It's too early for lunch. I know that. By a whole lot. But everybody has a few little things to do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, amplifiers and active elements which were uh, uh, whose delay was in fact not stable was and for all these reasons we rejected the idea and decided to to uh, to do to do an asynchronous uh, machine but one which was uh, was timed uh, and we simply inserted provided the means to vary the timing so that we could determine the uh, the, the the limits um, and that was the failure point of the uh, uh, machine and then just back off enough to provide the the um, the reliability desired uh, let me uh, can I make an interruption at this uh, no, I, I'd rather you okay. wait it until I finished the uh, the other aspects um, this this uh, helped us achieve higher speed and uh, and also in in, in uh, greatly simplifying the uh, the the um, control. Other areas in which we uh, which we change uh, which we made changes was in the input output or in where in fact we uh, could not follow Illinois because they were they had fallen behind and we didn't have enough information on it. This was true, for example, in uh, this was true of our channels and of our uh, controllers. And I would like to come back to this because uh, there are some uh, there are some interesting points about the particularly about the uh, magnetic tape system. Um, but I'd I'd like to close with a few words on the. Um, uh, the way in which the thing worked out. Uh, Penny Rabinovich was just talking about uh, the fact that he had a reputation for writing programs that worked the first time. Well, I also prided myself on being able to build equipment that would work the first time. And uh, I'd like to just state how close we got to that. Um, the, the machine was really built in stages. The first stage was the um, main arithmetic unit and it's a immediate control or what we call then delayed control or something like that and uh, yeah, and then we ran it uh, the way we tested it the way the university the, it was these things were tested at the university of illinois with a fibonacci series and this thing this piece of the machine was built and was turned on and ran it was, uh, I think, Ami Kaspi, that, uh, who really should have been here. We invited him. I don't know why he isn't here. Uh, um, uh, ran this part. and uh, But I cannot say that this was true of the rest of the machine. It's much harder to build a control that is flawless. And in fact, maybe the, the worst uh, problems we had in the control, uh, a problem was a sort of a logical error we found, which was permeated the control and we found it when we built a delayed control but luckily there were ways to to fix it and maybe even slightly improve it at that but it took us maybe it's we and I worked on this for maybe a month or two and uh, redesigning the one shot so that uh, this uh, this this uh, problem could be overcome and that's when we could uh, uh, so much for the for the for the uh, major problems or uh, the way in which the project went. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, we started in just getting ready for the thing for the project in 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 the fall in uh, October November of 1961, and by November 1963, the machine was already doing problems. But uh, it was working without an, uh, essentially without an input-output system, just with magnet, with paper, t uh, with punched paper tape, and the typewriter. Now you were eager to uh, interrupt and say something. By now you may have forgotten. No, no, no. Uh, I wanted to go back to the uh, speed-independent uh, logic of yes. uh, Illinois. One of their uh, arguments in favor of the method uh, was that in the event of any uh, breakdown or, or trouble with the equipment, it is extremely simple and elementary to locate the cause of the trouble. 
because uh, if one transistor fails, it, you can detect that particular transistor by uh, knowing the state of the machine. And the state in which it became hung up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It makes it extremely simple to debug. If you know the system, that logic is very convenient for uh, debugging. Of course, we, you've already stated uh, a lot of the uh, disadvantages of the, of the system. That, uh, that's altogether true. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I, I like to say, I was originally indoctrinated by Jerry into the... the uh, asynchronous. Not the asynchronous, yes, but I, I've now come out, I believe, the, the synchronous is not only uh, just at least as fast, but also more reliable and, and more early in the... In in the long run, than the asynchronous, because um, as things do not stay the same, as things deteriorate, it's, you it's not do better. You 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 can keep up longer with the synchronous. I re I can recall a conversation in 1961 when I visited uh, Poughkeepsie with a group of people from Illinois in a discussion with Eric Block who was then uh, in charge of the stretch program. At IBM. At IBM, mm -hmm. yes. And of course, uh, IBM being fully synchronous and Illinois being asynchronous, the question arose, what about asynchronism versus synchronism? And Eric Block said, yes, we know all about asynchronous machines. In fact, we have one built down in the basement and it's running. We don't know the difference between them. We, we can't tell the difference. It's just that their experience was all in synchronous and they kept going in synchronous. Yes, I, having worked on both sides of the fence, uh, I, I worked only on synchronous systems before coming to the Institute and on synchronous uh, here, I can't say that, uh, that um, that, that that's what makes the difference um, the, uh, as far as um, reliability is concerned. I think either system, if designed properly, can be reliable. Um, the, the fact is that you know, both experiences were, were very important, and even when you're designing synchronous system, you have to deal with the asynchronous properties between clock pulses. And in fact, as uh, systems have gotten faster and faster, and it has become more and more difficult to hold on to the universal, you know, clock moment. Uh, in fact, there is there's a return, you know, to both of these experiences in the in the ultra high speed uh, systems. In fact, if you think about it a bit, if you increase the number of steps, logical steps, in a synchronous system, it begins to approach an asynchronous system. Uh, I think Chaim would like to say... Yeah, yes, just, just one remark, in case there should be no misunderstanding. I, as a user, am very grateful to Taub that he allowed us to use his plans and cooperated with us to the, to the last moment, and that helped uh, Golem. Here, here. It certainly saved us a year or two in the design time. And, um, well, I'd like to... Uh, Hans also yeah. been seeking it. Yes, I've been trying to say something about it. Um, I was concerned with software, and I spent a year at the University oh, of yeah, we haven't gotten to the software. Yeah. No, but this has there. to do with the design. Yeah. Sure. And um, one of the things that Abe Tau was um, uh, very strong about was anti Fortran. That's right. It would, it would, this that, machine was too valuable to waste that's right. that compilation. Yeah. Okay, now, now we can, now, this, this is where I want to make a point. Um, at the University of Illinois, the year I was there, they also had an IBM 1792 with a Fortran compiler. And the input what year was that? 62, 63. Yes, I arrived and you left. Yeah, I that's right, at the that. same time. Yeah. And um, the, the, 62. Yeah. You yes. left and he arrived. No, I arrived here. Uh, and, and, he he, he, yes, and he for left Illinois. for Illinois. Um, yeah, the other way. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> the, 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 the thing about the there were two things that were interesting that were copied here as well, which had to do with the fact the, the Abe Taub's thinking, which was that you could control the machine completely one step at a time from the console. And nowadays you wouldn't yes. dream of doing these things. But this did make it possible 
to detect errors when they came, you could enter through the switches if you needed to. You, you could enter instructions into the uh, memory of the machine and exercise it directly from the console, one instruction at a time. As a matter of fact, Hans, uh, this idea of being able to run the step by step from the console is, all, is, is a feature which, uh, which I always put in and which many people put in, not for the programmer, but for the troubleshooting. For the that troubleshoot, is, of course. That is not for the troubleshooting of programs, but the troubleshooting no, of, the, of machine. the machine. And uh, and w I um, I think it uh, I think it should be there on every machine. Um, yeah. the, one of the things that this machine was different from the previous machines that it had instructions where you could add an address to the address of the next instruction. Now I think one of the very very few errors that we discovered when I was writing the um, uh, error, the um, checkout routines with three was that the interrupt could occur between these two and would add the, this address to the jump instruction of the interrupt. It was the, and, the and add to next feature. The add to next yes. feature. And that really was uh, foul things up and it was very difficult to find out where it came from after it had stopped until we discovered where the floor was. Mm -hmm. I think other than that, I think really the uh, machine was remarkably trouble free during the checkout period. Well, we kept that add to next in, into goal and B as well, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I've never right. really, uh, Well, I, I think what I would like to do now before we break is, uh, is and before going on to the software side, which is a long story in itself, and also the, uh, the development into a dual machine with, with a disk and so on, which supported this higher level software. But I'd like to maybe, this is a little bit of gossip really, that um, as usual in every uh, computer project, even uh, though this was a short one, there were um, there were there were there were traps. In fact, usually somebody comes along and says, "Well, why should we do it? Maybe we should abandon it, or it has some better idea." In this case, it was um, the head of Elliot Computers in England, uh, whose name escapes me, Sir Bagrat. Sir Bagrat. Sir Bagrat. Bagrat. Well, he had uh, he had trapped the Technion into a thing like that. That is, they had a machine, a rather low-level serial machine, but he thought the world of it, and uh, he managed to talk the Technion into into accepting one as a gift or now, something like that. Whose machine was this? This was, this was the, 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 the Elliot the machine. machine. Yeah. And uh, in fact, they suffered for years until they could they could prove to people that really this machine is not a worth uh, much and that they, it doesn't, couldn't possibly satisfy their needs and they could go on to some other machine. But uh, he tried the same trick here and uh, maybe Chaim can uh, fill in some of the, I may not know all the ins and outs, but um, here we found ourselves um, uh, facing the same kind of trap. And uh, of course, I must say from the beginning that uh, this strategic part, uh, Chaim handled all of that. <laughs> But it ended up that um, the, the, the clever move on Chaim's part was that he, of course, he didn't turn the thing down, but instead he said, look, if you think that this is, uh, this machine, this, uh, they said, it will take too long, they'll never finish it on time, it'll, it'll never work, and uh, why bother, uh, you can have one of our machines. So he invited um, uh, Bagrat, uh, Sir Bagrat, uh, Sir... So Leon, 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 Leon yeah. to send his chief engineer here, and also to get an, 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 a disinterested party, uh, no less a, a person than than uh, than, than uh, Professor Wilkes was invited to to uh, uh, look over the project and evaluate it. This was when we were in the real, this was real early before we could really show them very much, but the plans were all there and pieces were coming into, were beginning to get put together. So these people did, uh, and, and spent a couple of weeks with us and uh, had long talks and uh, to our relief, they, they both decided, including the, uh, the chief engineer of uh, the Elliott Brothers, that the, that the project was sound and that it was worth going on 
And uh, rather than it hurting us, this gave us a boost and we were able to get help and, uh, and support. And this was sort of the, politically, was the critical point in the project. And maybe yeah, Chaim yeah, can uh, one fill one point in. This, yeah. uh, Salim Bakovic was terribly uh, angry at me when we decided to buy an interim computer between Breitzek and Golan, the 1604. I will tell that uh, some other time. The next thing he, he did was to try to, he was the president of the Elliott Company. He tried to um, stop the Golem uh, computer project, load us with one of his computers. And he got on the phone to Lord Victor Rothschild. And wrote That's to the him. English uh, Rothschild? Yeah, in, in London, yeah. And. Uh, Victor Ocho couldn't uh, avoid it. He, he stayed on the phone a long time. Uh, finally, uh, Victor Ocho said uh, his usual technique in a, in a controversial matter like this, I will send a royal commission to investigate the uh, situation, like they used to do under the British government, under, British, under the mandatory government. So it was, uh, and he picked his expert, and he picked on Wilkes. Well, he couldn't have made a much better choice, yeah. actually. So he sent down Wilkes, and we were tense in here, because they could have clamped down on the whole, uh, whole project. <laughs> uh, and Wilkes handed down a favorable, he's, I mean, he's, um, it's like a billum story. He, the man who, whom uh, Bugget uh, caused to come in here, and they handed in a report against what, what he wanted. That was the story, yeah. And Victor Ocho, Lord Victor Ocho, came uh, came in, into the scene a little bit earlier in connection with the 1604. The same Leon Baggett, but uh, that may be uh, told later. Yeah. So we will be here this afternoon. I'm hopeful people will be here. <coughs> well, if in fact we should reach a breaking point. Well, you finish okay. Your, your say, Perhaps. You Perhaps the thing that I would um, maybe like to finish with in this session is that. Um, um, only the other uh, only the other day, I ran across an article. This is from uh, uh, October 1982, which reminded me of another uh, um, contribution on the Golan project, meaning tech technical contribution, which uh, we need, we didn't publish, uh, so it was reinvented by somebody else. But here. Um, uh, this had to do with error uh, detection and correction on tape. Now, uh, initially, the magnetic tape was our our main uh, backup uh, memory until we got to the disk. And um, I didn't tell you that uh, tape had its problems. Now, so we were looking for a way to uh, detect and correct errors. Well. Um, Later on, uh, much better uh, techniques were developed, but at that time, it was strictly the uh, IBM NRZ I-1 was, was used, uh, and it had uh, parity, lateral parity, and it had one uh, byte, uh, one uh, character, par uh, parity character at the end of the block, and so uh, you could find out whether uh, you had an error, uh, uh, perhaps, unless you had canceling errors, but you certainly couldn't correct any errors and keep them going. Well, while Sri and I worked on the, uh, on the controller for the tape, uh, and we saw that in fact it uh, made sense to, um, uh, to buffer a whole word, and uh, if you remember the, uh, uh, the golden word was long, uh, we could in fact uh, catch an error in a word before we shipped it to the computer and correct it if we only had an, a method to do it. It turned out there was a very, uh, very nice and very uh, economical way to do that. And that was simply to put another uh, parody character. Can you 
Is he on the meter? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, the signal, the signal to noise ratio that I'm watching. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So when you give me a, a signal, I'll stop again. Stop it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, you could simply put uh, an, another character, uh, parody character, at the end of the of the word. So it was a, the characters in those days were six bit characters, and so to cover a seventy five bit word, you needed uh, thirteen, I guess. Is that right? Thirteen times mm -hmm. six, seventy eight. So we simply added one more, and that gave us a coordinate uh, scheme which pointed directly to the bit which was at fault. And you would have a single error correction, double error detection. In fact, you could detect many multiple errors also, but not all, but of course not all of them, but there were many that you could also detect. This is true of most uh, double error detecting systems. Why wasn't and, that published? Uh, the, the, why well, didn't we publish uh, anything about the Golden Ball together? Uh, that's another story. But. Um, but the fact is, uh, I was rather happy about this. This is a very uh, nice scheme, and in fact, we ran we ran tests on this in order to find out whether uh, it was effective. And uh, so we ran a lot of tests. We would run this at night when the machine wasn't busy. Uh, I think we ran it actually on the one sixty. I believe, but I believe uh, Yigal never relied on it. Oh, uh, and never he saw that happening. He, he had it his, This is fine. He had, he had additional uh, sum checks and so on. That's okay. But 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 the fact is that there were many errors that he never even knew because our error correction was transparent no, no, to the user. Was, there was a, there was a special register. There was a bit saying an error has been corrected. That's right. And when Yigal saw this, he... He would rerun this. He did it over. Well, that's his, that's his privilege, but nevertheless... No, I, I should, in, all, in all fairness, I should say that the nature of errors on tape is such that if you get an error in one, in one uh, character, you're very likely to get another error in the next character in the same bit position. And, um, well, in, in fact, as, uh, in fact, you can make a, a simple modification of this scheme that would cover that, and that would have been a lot more valuable, and we should maybe have gone to the next, but I was so economy-minded at the time that I uh, didn't go that far. Uh, economy, in this case, means also the, uh, the amount of extra of, of space you waste on the, on the tape. But in any case, Tzvi ran long tests and he, he could measure the effect of this and it was significant. I won't say that it was fantastic, but it was a significant improvement. What, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that um, now, of course, they're working on error correction and detection and correction techniques for, for um, a semiconductor memory. And um, I just, uh, in 82, in the end, near the end of 82, uh, someone uh, by the name of Osman uh, wrote an article which uh, really brings up the same scheme only applied to semiconductor memory. And he quotes Edwards. I guess this is Edwards in England. Uh, Edwards, that's the man yeah. who was here. That's Edwards was the man who was here. Yes. And, uh, and he wrote it. From No, no, no. no. No, there was an Edwards in Manchester. Yes. Yes. Now this, this, it may not be the same Edwards. This is L. Edwards, and he uh, describes this, uh, and, and he he reinvented the scheme in uh, in 1981, in July 1981. At least he published it in 81. Perhaps he invented it in 80. And um, I think the jet so, is closing our session. <laughs> okay, so, so this. It's only about 30 seconds. What you say? Okay, so this, I think maybe this is a good place to close. I just brought this up as, a, as an interesting uh, side issue, which uh, keeps, in other words, I, uh, years later, I keep uh, coming up against things we did, which we didn't think much enough of to publish, but which people are uh, reinventing now. You want to read the question? You didn't answer, uh, Jerry, there's a question. Why didn't you publish?